FAMU's athletic director steps down after less than three years, but in that short time, he made a big impact. And Zach Blackerby of Locked On Auburn joins the show to talk about D. Davis's move to Alabama State. Oh, yeah, it's Locked On HBCU. Play my music. <laughs> Locked on HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On HBCU Podcast, your number one daily one-stop shop for everything HBCU athletics, Monday through Friday, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And I, of course, am Darian Gray, a.k.a. the Mouth of the South, Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports Editor. Thank you for going on this journey with me, Make a Locked On HBCU your first listen of the day every day. And I want to talk about Florida A&M's Athletic director, I almost said new, but I actually mean former athletic director, Courtney Gaucher. And he wasn't at FAMU for a long time. It was almost time for an extension, actually. It was there for less than three years. But the impact that he made was felt by everybody, not just a select few, but it felt like the community of Florida A&M really rallied around him and really felt like, man, this guy is the one who could stop the revolving door of athletic directors at this institution. Now, I want to get kind of the elephant out of the room, and some people feel like this could be connected to the to the um, Urban Edge Network SWAC situation. I don't know. I don't want to speak on that because that's not fact. I don't want to say that he resigned because of pressure from it. That's not fact, and I'm going to try to stay rooted in the things that actually have happened have been proven correct thus far. And for that reason, I'm not going to speak on that going forward for this particular issue. So let's just look at what he what he's done, what he's accomplished. I want to talk about his press release and how he announced his departure. In this quote, he said, my alignment and core values are very important to me. And there is no secret that we created a transform transformational student athlete experience second to none that has elevated Florida agricultural and mechanical that will place them on a trajectory beyond my tenure. I am incredibly proud of the work and the people that have done that work in such a short time. We have elevated the program and institutional reputation to a level of new credibility. That's what every athletic director should be trying to do. Listen, creating a transformational student athlete experience that is second to none. First off, you ain't trying to come in second, clearly, but as an athletic director, you're supposed to be taking care of these student athletes. Not just on the athletic side of things, but on the student athlete side of it. You have to understand that it's all of it. All of that goes into play. So he's done that. And they've done so many things, right? So <laughs> it's funny because I say that everybody's kind of rallied around him. And it feels like it's in the wake of his resignation. Let's remember, he resigned. He stepped down. He was not fired. He was not let go. It didn't even sound like it was a mutual thing. It sounded as if Gaucher decided, I'm going to step down. Now, it was not a long time. However, when I say that he's connected and he's made an impact, I want to talk about the emotional side first because we don't really talk about that. Let me just be honest. That's not the side that we typically focus on. And people connected. I'm talking about the baseball coach and Willie Simmons, the football coach, came in and spoke glowingly of him, glowingly of Gaucher, talking about everything that he's done and the baseball coach has been there for nine years. So for nine years, he's went through multiple athletic directors. And for him to speak on that, it's it's one of those things where, oh, OK, you've been through a lot of these guys. Your opinion really counts for something. And then with Simmons, he talked about a couple of things. And on his personal side, he said that I feel comfortable being a leader. We're going to get to an exact quote from Simmons, because I felt like what he said about Gaucher was really it was really one of those things where it put it in perspective just how much of an impact that he had on Simmons. But first off, they said Simmons has been being courted by other schools. And he, Gaucher, has made Simmons feel like staying at FAMU is worthwhile. He thanked him for always creating a worthwhile experience. And it kind of, you know, talked about how this guy, Simmons, is being courted to go elsewhere. And I'm not saying that now he's going to leave. That's not at all. That's not what I'm saying. However, I am saying that 
he felt so content and comfortable being there because Gaucher has created an environment that makes you want to not go anywhere. Not just simply the relationship he has with Go Gaucher, but the re, um, the environment that he created is what has made everybody so comfortable. But let's get into what Simmons said, because this was a quote that I felt was powerful and really spoke highly of not only who Gaucher was at FAMU, but who he can be elsewhere if he does decide to go be an AD um, some other place. He said, Simmons said, in all my years of working in intercollegiate athletics, I've never witnessed someone who did so much with so little um, in such a short amount of time. Right there. Doing a lot with a little is, is already a compliment. But talking about in, in the time frame that he did it, this just it just continues going. Let's let's listen. In. Your visionary leadership matched with your genuine care for the welfare of our student athletes make you a generational talent as an athletic director as we march into the future during the renaissance of black college athletics i feel more confident than ever in my ability to lead under your leadership now that was put out before it was actually put out the day of but before gaucher decided to step down so you hear things in there like the last line i'm excited to lead under your leadership i believe in my ability as if it's present so that was put out just before that and then he also talked about just the disappointment and the fact that the emotion that Gaucher felt is the same emotion that he and he and his people felt at the same time at the resignation. It was it was truly powerful and moving. And you look at it, he's talking about the care for the student athletes, how much he how much he's done in such a little amount of time. There are so many aspects at play here where it's like, no, this guy is great. And if you needed any other glowing representation of what Gaucher was for FAMU, Willie Simmons just called this man a generational talent as an athletic director. I didn't even know we were describing athletic directors as generational talents. I didn't know. But to call him that, I think really goes a long way and it means a lot. But let's look at exactly what he's done because he's done a lot as far as betterment of FAMU. But when you say it, you kind of have to bring up the facts behind it. And I want to read it. So I'm going to get my breath together because it's a long list. He's repaired Bragg uh, Stadium. He's renovated the field house. Volleyball, baseball, softball all have new playing fields. The LeBron James partnership, which fitted out the uh, athletic program and the band. And then also he created the Why Not Us series. That's a lot to do in just a few years. I'm talking about repairing the, the facilities, improving the facilities, improving the stadium, giving people new places to play. These are problems and issues that HBCUs have been talking about all the time. And he came in, he stepped in, he took charge, and he helped fix that you have to appreciate that he had the partnership with lebron he has to increase visibility from the why not us series and it's in the cap it all off in the beginning of his tenure he said you know what i'm going to move fam you from the MEAC to the swag and boy now does that look like such a bright idea he did that within less than a year of him becoming a fam you athletic director and if there's one thing that i hope becomes true from all of this is a sentence from actually gauche's press conference and he said that I hope that this will place them or he hopes that he has done things to place them on a trajectory beyond his tenure. That's overall the, the goal in all of this. So you got to you got to show the respect for what he has done. His resignation is his resignation. Well, when you look back on his tenure, I think you will look on it pretty fondly for the years to come. Now, going forward, I'm going to have Zach Blackaby of Locked On Auburn on to talk about D Davis. That's where he came from before Bama State. Let's see everything from an Auburn perspective. But first, I want to tell you about Bet Online because BetOnline.net is the number one place for all of your sports betting. I don't care if it's the NBA playoffs. I don't care if it's the MLB. I don't care if it's the latest UFC event. I heard a lot of things going on. I I'm still waiting for Uzman Leon Edwards. Off the top of my head, I can't think about when that's coming out. Then you have Pena Nunez, their ultimate fighter, um, show is going to come out soon which means the fight will be soon after that there are so many events to bet on and i'm just saying i've been talking about the nba playoffs but it's these other events as well and if ufc baseball basketball even the football season odds they just aren't your thing get your favorite vegas casino games and they'll have that too bet online is so versatile in addition to being the fastest and easiest way to wager on all of your favorite sports bet online where the game starts all right, so we're rolling on today's episode of Locked On HBCU. Thank you for making us your first listen of the day every day. And don't forget that we are still going with our Locked On NFL mock draft. You can catch that on our Locked On NFL draft podcast feed and Odyssey, telling you everything as far as 
who do your local experts think that your favorite team is going to select? Now, who they actually select will be revealed on the Locked On NFL Draft a live show on April 28th, 29th, and 30th. That will be on the Locked On NFL YouTube page, coverage for all seven rounds. And today, I have Locked On Auburn's host, Zach Blackerby, here to talk about exactly what was D. Davis's journey in Auburn all the way to Alabama State. All right, Zach, so I'm researching D. Davis, trying to f figure out what he's going to bring to Alabama State. And one of the things that I found the most interesting is that he committed or signed to Auburn when there was no coach. To me, that's, that screams an extreme commitment and loyalty to the program and to the university. Is that something that stayed constant while he was there? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, when Auburn fired Gus Malzahn a few weeks before that, there was a lot of panic among Auburn fans like, Oh, please do anything to keep D Davis. And uh, as soon as he signed that dotted line and Auburn's official football account put out like signed in a national letter of intent signed by D Davis, you know, Auburn fans were so stoked because there was so much promise in this guy, so much athleticism. And so, yeah. And then Harson, Brian Harson gets hired at Auburn uh, a few weeks after that. And he's all about culture and relationships and loyalty. And so uh, myself included in, in the, the large part of the Auburn fan base thought that that would be rewarded. Yeah. And Darian, I don't know if that ever was. Um, it doesn't really seem like he was ever given a legitimate shot. There were plenty of opportunities late in the season last year, specifically in the bowl game where it kind of felt like, okay, we're finally going to get to see D Davis take the field. And it didn't happen. It didn't happen after Bo Nix suffered a season ending uh, ankle injury and then TJ Finley was thrust in and he was limping everywhere. He was clearly injured, but they kept him in instead of putting D in. It was interesting. It was super interesting. And a lot of Auburn fans expected him to transfer. He didn't. Once again, showing that loyalty to Auburn. And then spring practice rolled around. They go out and get two new transfer quarterbacks. And uh, about halfway through spring, he hit the portal. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, that's an interesting uh, starting point, but that's where all his, his Auburn career started. Uh, there's no question about it. So the loyalty, I, I don't think, was a two-way street. Okay, well, let's let's jump. Let's forget all the in-between for a little bit, and let's jump from the starting point to the ending point. You say he wasn't ever thrusted in, even though it seemed like he could have been, and I think a lot of people expected him to transfer before spring practice he transferred in the middle of spring practice so how do you go from a guy who is so highly touted those with a different coaching staff how do you go from a guy like that to where both sides are saying all right it's ready we're time to break apart yeah i'm sure we wanted to see where he was in the pecking order of things because i mean auburn is in the middle of a quarterback battle they went out and got uh, zach calzada from texas a&m and then of course tj finley started three games for the tigers last year and they got Robbie Ashford, a kid up uh, from the state of Alabama, but uh, he, he was playing at Oregon. So it was those four guys, and they've got a hot shot true freshman coming in as well. And so like it was a wide open thing. And I remember going into it, I was like, okay, there's no way all five of these dudes actually get real reps. Like there's just no way. It's impossible. It's impossible. I mean, you can say it all you want. It's just not possible. There's only so many reps in practice. And so – it seemed like in, in passing drills where the media kind of got their open viewing period, he was third or fourth in all of those. Okay. And you have to assume that was kind of reflected in 11 on 11 drills. And after a few weeks of that, I think he called it. I mean, it makes sense from his side. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah. When you look at his transfer or entering the transfer portal, Take me back. I know that was like almost a month ago, but take sure. me back. Where did you think that you were going to see D Davis land? I thought he would go to the big 12. He's okay. a Texas guy, you know, went to North shore, a big, uh, big high school in Houston. I, I thought this would be a state of Texas guy. And there was talk about um, him being tied to UTSA. I think they ended up picking somebody else. I don't remember who, but that's just kind of what I assumed. I thought he would still be, a power five player because I think now at this point of the year, 
you're done adding guys in the transfer portal. They're going to be starters for you this year. You're, you're getting guys that are redshirt freshmen or redshirt sophomores that have potential and they just didn't really fit with what their new school was doing. So they needed to leave. I, I think that's kind of where we're at. Um, so I was surprised when the news broke that it was Alabama State. And it's funny, folks, in uh, the Locked on Auburn Discord, Darian, they, uh, you know, D likes to be cryptic on social media. And, and that may have been what some of the issue was with him and Brian Harson, assuming there was an issue. But Harson doesn't like that stuff. And so, um, you know, he, he was always kind of posting cryptic things. And he posted one where it was like uh, you could see a few of the colors on the jersey and the Adidas logo. And it's like, all right. There's not that many Adidas schools anymore. And so they're like, is it Alabama State? Is he going to Alabama State? We're like, no, no, I I don't think so. He's got to be going back to Texas somewhere. But yeah, lo and behold, yeah, he went to Alabama State. D. Davis had an interesting journey to Alabama State. He started off with so much promise at Auburn, but ultimately things just did not work out. We're going to talk about how a lot of that had to deal with the fact he just was not a scheme fit for the new head coach. But first, I want to tell you about Built Bar because Built Bar is the best protein bar on the market, bar none. I promise you, there are so many flavors to choose from and to have that many flavors and still have all of the health benefits that it had. I think that is ridiculous. When you look at it, you talk about 17 grams of protein. So the protein is there. Four grams of sugar, four net carbs. So you're not really having the negative effects. You're only having the positive benefits or benefits while also having the delicious flavor because it is covered in chocolate. But if you get the built puffs, it's going to be covered in chocolate and marshmallows. Oh my gosh, it sounds so fattening. But for some reason, Built Bar has made it to where it isn't. Still 17 grams of protein, four grams of sugar, and four net carbs. So make sure that you go into built.com and using the promo code LOCKED15. For 15% off your offer. All right, as we're wrapping up today's episode of Locked on HBCU, Zach is going to be telling you how the schematic fit that didn't exist in Auburn does not mean that Alabama State cannot maximize D. Davis's skill set. That right there, which you just detailed about, are we thinking he's going to go back to SMU, maybe some bigger yeah. school in, in Texas, and then, nah, I can't be Alabama State. That denial... I think that's why this is such a big move for HBCUs because you're looking at a guy who everybody thought was going to continue on this power five journey, but he didn't. So I want to ask you as far as Auburn, I heard a lot of people say it's not quite the player. It's the fit within the system. Why do people say he just did not fit with the new system in Auburn? Yeah, so, I mean, Gus Malzahn flourished with dual-threat quarterbacks, right? Cam Newton and Nick Marshall, and, and that can be the list. And I think everybody's like, okay, yeah, that's enough. That's enough. Two national championship appearances with those two guys. Um, Brian Harson is not that. Brian Harson's quarterbacks, dating back to when he was at Boise, even when he was the OC at Texas, those guys stayed in the pocket. They delivered the football downfield. Sometimes he'd have guys that were athletic enough to extend the play, but they were still just moving around in the pocket. They weren't doing anything with their legs. D. Davis, I mean, he's an electric athlete. Uh, I, I don't think there's any question about that. His highlight tape at North Shore is crazy. It's one of the better ones I've ever seen. Like, I mean, he is so talented. Uh, and doing it at the level that he did, at the highest level of high school football in the country. I mean, that's just so telling. So, um, But, yeah, Harson doesn't do that with his quarterbacks. He's not going to have any design runs for those guys. It's not going to be zone read type things. With the exception of a few RPOs, I mean, it's pretty much what's, what you call them, the huddles, what you're doing. Um, and if things break down, there's a check down in line for you. He doesn't want his quarterbacks getting hit. I mean, he's just a kind of a, a pro-style-minded guy. And so when you look at the guys that are there now, TJ Finley and, and Zach Calzada are the two guys that are probably going to start, and neither of those guys move extremely well. They can move enough, but they're not going to hurt you um, with their feet. So, yeah, I mean, it was a system thing which is weird because it, it seems like, you know, at any level of college football, I think any head coach would be like, yeah, I'd prefer to have a quarterback that can run, but that's just not what Harson has done historically. Yeah, that makes sense where it's just we don't mesh. What I want to do and what you want to do just don't go together. You called him an electric athlete, and I want to talk about his legs. How does he use his legs not just in the running game but also in the passing game? Yeah, yeah. He'll, he extends the plays. I mean, you, you see him get flushed out of the pocket, rolling to his right. He's a right-handed quarterback. And 
Um, he's he's still looking downfield, and still this is all high school tape where you look at it, it's like this is the most talented guy on the field. Um, you could tell the game moves slower for him than everyone else, which is what you want to see in a quarterback. But he did everything, and then I mean there were times where it was so open, Darian, where it's like yeah, run the ball, D, and you know he he take it to the house. I mean he, he's able to do everything, and he actually he actually earned the nickname from a lot of the Auburn fan base. They called him Thick Marshall because. Um, he, he looks similar to Nick Marshall uh, with what Auburn fans saw him do in 2013 and 2014, but it had a little more size to him and, w- and was able to take hits in the pocket and stay on his feet and, and kind of use a little bit more power in his running style, which, I mean, I- I'm saying all these things and it's like, why would you not want this guy on his team, on, on your team? And so um, it, I-, 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 I don't think the legs were the issue. With, with his game, I think it's his passing. And I don't think his passing is bad. I just don't think he was ready yet. Um, but I think he will be. And, and I think uh, I think he's going to be great at Alabama State. Yeah, and it, here's the thing. And I think a lot of people understand this is that 95% of players are system guys. You can't just throw somebody yeah. in any system. You need to mess around and see how are they going to fit. So, obviously, fit was a problem in Alabama in Auburn right it's not going to be in Alabama State I would assume so because they just had him transfer in how do you maximize D Davis's skill set yeah and if I remember correctly Alabama State had a dual threat guy last year Auburn played them um and and Alabama State had some players there too we were kind of prepping you know throughout the week and there's like there's like five or six dudes I'm like I think they could play uh on Auburn so um but they, they had a dual threat situation, and, and that was something that I remember p- talking about going into that game was like, okay, how does Auburn defense do against a mobile quarterback? And from a scheme standpoint, it's like, D. Davis is going to fit in great here, I think. I, I, I think. And it seems like Alabama State always has a solid running game, and so mm-hmm. you know being able to kind of complement that with a, with a quarterback that can move like D. Davis, I mean, the sky's the limit for what they're going to be able to do. Yeah, and I just want to ask you this. This is why I'll have you here. Okay. The idea of spring practices, and I'm I'm a big NFL guy, and you see a lot of joint practices. Why don't why don't we see that more in the collegiate game? Maybe an Alabama State uh scrimmaging against somebody, maybe an, an Auburn or an Alabama or an Alabama AM going against an Auburn or an Alabama or a South Alabama. Why don't That's we see fun. these college schools go against each other in scrimmages? Is it something that pre- prevents it? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it seems like um, conf, interconference stuff is weird, right? So I, I would yeah, assume there's a layer yeah. of that. And I think, you know, when we did the whole COVID year where it's like nobody wanted to play other conferences because everybody wanted their own rules. Um, I, I think that was kind of part of it. But, um, it, Darren, it seems like college coaches are way more paranoid than NFL coaches, right? I mean... It could be a small sample size just based on the guys that I've gotten to cover at Auburn and throughout the SEC, but it just seems like they are just so less open. I mean, you've got guys that won't release depth charts. You've got schools that are like, nope, every practice is closed. Media can't watch the guys stretch. That That's too much. That's too much information. So I would guess it would have something to do with that. Um, is that legitimate? I don't know, but I, I think that'd be awesome. I think that'd be so good. Uh it seems like so many different folks would benefit from that. Yeah, I would love to see some FBS, FCS type yeah. of scrimmages in this where you're not really going against each other. If you're not on the uh, schedule, then, hey, let's do it. And it's not as if they're going to be a competitor to you. That's that's something. Maybe we're progressing in the future. Maybe Locked On Auburn, Locked On HBCU. Let's get it going, going together and Yeah. We'll start a, start a charge. FBS versus FCS spring practice scrimmages. Let's, let's do it. But, Zach, man, I, I do appreciate you coming on, giving this breakdown of D. Davis's journey from Auburn to Alabama State. I'm excited to see what he can be in the fall if, you know, he wins out this quarterback battle in Bama State. Do you think he will? Uh, You know, while we're having this conversation, I mean, a a few folks have asked me, like, is D. Davis going to win the quarterback job? And I'm like, I assume so. I mean, it's so difficult. Okay. It's so difficult because there's a new coach in town. Maybe if it was the same coach, you'd be like, this guy doesn't really feel this guy, but it's so much. It's their spring practice or the spring game is coming up. It's it's a lot of uncertainty. I know it would seem like he would get it, but 
I don't know. And he he didn't get to go through the spring like the rest of the guys. That, that'll be a an interesting thing to watch play out. And they had a lot of turmoil last year. Three different guys started. I could see D. Davis grabbing that spot if somebody doesn't have a kung fu grip on it and saying, you know what, I'm not letting go of it. That's that's what I could see happening. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it seems like his approach to the game is is pretty professional. Um, I was told by somebody close to his camp um, that there were conversations going into the season where he was totally okay, like sitting back and being redshirted and just not being the guy quite yet and developing in a system. Okay. Um, which to me shows maturity, right? And, and awareness. Mm-hmm. I think self-awareness is so important for athletes to be successful, especially student athletes. And so I think now he feels like it's his, it's his time. I think, I think he's done sitting. I think he feels like he's developed enough as a quarterback and is ready to play. And I, I just don't think he would have transferred somewhere if he doesn't feel like he'd get that job. And yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know who he's competing against or, you know, who's returning or anything like that, but I, I didn't realize it was a new coach either, Darian. Yeah. But so he, I, I'll say this. He yeah. I think he has the job. He'll, he a hundred percent has the chance, probably a better chance than he did at Auburn sure. simply because of schematic fit and whatnot. Now it's about going out there and beating it. I, I don't think he's going to be handed the job, but he'll yeah. definitely have an a hundred percent opportunity to get it. And I, I mean, We've got to get you back on here. Hopefully, uh, I don't know what Auburn's schedule is, so maybe they have some of these HBCUs on, on their schedule. we got to get you back on here, Zach, but I appreciate you coming on. Of course, Darian. Of course, you're doing a great job over here, brother. Thank you. I appreciate it. Take care. Much appreciation to Zach Black and be coming on. Make sure that you're checking out Locked On Auburn as well. He's giving great insight, and you get to hear a little bit more of him. I, I love the fact that even though D. Davis transferred from Auburn, It doesn't feel like he's spoiled good. Do you hear the way that he talks about him? There's still that player in in there that had Black and be so excited. Now, we're going to continue next week, and we're going to be talking about the the NFL draft and then also the Jackson State spring game. It's a loaded week next week. I am super happy. I am through the roof. And you need to make sure that next week, especially, you are making us your locked or making us your first listen of the day every day. Because you're going to want to feel this. Now, for your second listen, make sure you're checking out Locked on NFL Draft because it's all gearing up to that big moment. And Eric Crocker and Ryan Tracy are going to be giving you everything that you need for all seven rounds of the NFL Draft. Now, in the meantime, in between time, if you want to talk to me, catch up with me, you can find me on Twitter at South Exclusives. Until the next time that we hear each other, family, take care, stay blessed. Peace.